Good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. I haven't been on here since December, so um, hope everyone is doing well with our new year upon us. Um, we have another great lineup here today, um, again, focused um, mostly on labor, well, exclusively on labor topics today. Um, so let me just run you quick, quickly through the agenda, uh, and then we'll get, we'll get started. We're going to start, as you can see here on this slide, with Callie Schreiner, um, a, an associate here in our Syracuse um, office regarding some um, legislation that would be that will be enacted in March regarding access to employees social media accounts and some restrictions there that you need to be aware of. I want to note on this topic that this is based on a request from one of you. So um, as Kathy just said, we do appreciate your input and your surveys. We look at those and this was a specific request from a, um, um, a viewer. So um, here you go. And um, after that, we have our forum or host who all of you um, probably know and recognize Adam Mastroleo is back to talk about um, the final independent contractor rules that were recently issued by the U.S. Department of Labor. I'll jump in to talk about um, some state legislation um, and then another frequent contributor, Tom Iran, um, another partner here in our Syracuse Labor Department, will talk um, about some recent activity with Congress, actually. So um, with that, let's get started with Callie um, to talk about this new New York state law. Go right ahead, Callie. Thanks, Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. As Kristen mentioned, my name is Callie Schreiner, and today I'm going to discuss the new law in New York that prohibits access to an employee's private social media. Um, next slide, please. So effective March 12, 2024, New York adds section 201I to the labor law. This section is entitled Request for Access to Personal Accounts Prohibited. And the law does just that and restricts employers from requesting or requiring access to employees and applicants' personal social media accounts. New York is joining a growing number of states that have recently enacted laws that restrict an employer's access to employee and applicant social media accounts. The legislative history noted that of recent, employers were using various types of social media in decisions dealing with the hiring and disciplinary actions regarding prospective and current employees. Specifically, there were reports of employers demanding login information, including username and password information, to social media websites such as Facebook and Twitter, as well as login information to email accounts and other extremely personal accounts. This information was then being used as a condition for hire, as well as promotions, lateral movement within companies, and matters relating to disciplinary actions, including termination. Assemblyman Dinowitz explained that not only do these types of requests lead to issues of unfair and discriminatory hiring practices. They're also a serious invasion of privacy on behalf of the employer. Next slide, please. So the new law broadly def defines the term employer, and it includes a person or entity engaged in a business, industry, profession, trade, or other enterprise in the state, the state of New York, a county, city, town, village, or any other political subdivision or civil division of the state, a school district or any government entity operating a public school, college, or university, a public improvement or special district, a public authority, commission, or public benefit corporation, or any other public corporation, agency, instrumentality, or unit of government which exercises governmental power under the laws of the state and an agent, representative, or designee of the employer. However, the law does not apply to any law enforcement agency, fire department, or a department of corrections and community supervision. Next slide, please. So the new law will prohibit employers from requesting, requiring, or coercing employees or job applicants to disclose any username and password, password alone, or other login information for accessing a personal account through an electronic communication device. Uh, the statute defines an electronic communication device as any device that uses electronic signals to create, transmit, and receive information, which we know includes things like computers, telephone, um, personal digital assistance. Next slide, please. The law also prohibits employers from accessing an employee's personal accounts in the presence of the employer, and it prevents an employer from reproducing in any manner photographs, video, or other information contained from personal accounts in a means prohibited above. The statute further prohibits the employer from discharging, disciplining, or otherwise penalizing or threatening to discharge an employee for the refusal to disclose such protected information, 
and an employer is similarly prohibited from failing or refusing to hire any applicant as a result of the applicant's refusal to disclose the protected information. So these are two things that we want to know, and, and um, it's important in this statute because this is where the employer, you know, could face some some penalties. Next slide, please. So the law defines personal accounts uh, quite broadly and as an account or profile on an electronic medium where users may create, share, and view user-generated content, including uploading or downloading videos or still photographs, blogs, video blogs, podcasts, instant messages, or internet website profiles, or locations that are that is used by an employee or an applicant exclusively for per personal purposes. However, the law will not apply to usernames and passwords for non-personal accounts that provide access to an employer's internal computer or information systems. Next slide, please. The, the new law is concerned with prohibiting employers from requiring disclosure of an employee or applicant's personal login credentials. It contains several carve-outs that will permit employers to access social media under certain cir circumstances, such that an employer will not be prohibited from requesting or requiring employees to disclose access information to an account provided the, by the employer where the account is used for business purposes and prior notice was given to the employee of the employer's right to request or require such access information. The employer is also not prohibited from requesting or requiring employees to disclose access information to an account known to an employer to be used for business purposes. Next slide, please. An employer is also not prohibited from accessing electronic communication devices, again, computers, phones, et cetera, that are paid for in whole or in part by the employer, where the payment for such devices was conditioned on the employer's right to access, the employee had prior notice, and the employee explicitly agreed to such conditions. Nevertheless, employers are prohibited from accessing any personal accounts on such device. Employers will also not be prohibited from accessing an account in order to comply with a court order. Employers can also continue restricting access to certain websites while using an employer's network or while using a device paid for by the employer where, again, the provision of or payment for such electronic communications device was conditioned on the employer's right to restrict such access and the employee was provided prior notice of and explicitly agreed to such conditions. Next slide, please. The law also does not prohibit or restrict an employer from complying with the duty to screen employees or applicants prior to hiring or to monitor or retain employee communications as established by federal law or self-regulatory organizations. The law will not prevent employers from viewing, accessing, or utilizing information about an employee or job applicant that is publicly available without login information. Specifically, employers will be permitted to view social media posts, including photographs, videos, messages that an employee, client, or third party voluntarily shares with the employer for purposes of obtaining reports of misconduct or investigating misconduct. The law does not prevent an employee from voluntarily adding an employer or the employer's agent as a social media connection. And the law also provides that it will be an affirmative defense to any legal action pursuant to 201I that the employer acted to comply with the requirements of federal, state, or local laws. Next slide, please. So as far as the next steps are concerned, employers should carefully review their social media policies in light of the new law and implement appropriate inter internal procedures. Employers should construct required notices and acknowledgements to ensure compliance with the law's exemptions. And as indicated above, there are several exemptions which require specific notification and agreement from the employee. And finally, employers should review their hiring practices to ensure they remain compliant with the new law. All set, is that is that the finale? That's, that's it. <laughs> that's it, okay, great, I wasn't sure. Um, so, well, thank you so much. Um, you know, one thing I, that I noted that you said was that um, with respect to devices that are owned or paid for by the employer, there was a couple of criteria um, that were um, in place it, to allow an employer to look at those devices. And one of them said explicitly agreed to such conditions. So I think I would add to this list, not just reviewing your social media policies, right, but your general computer use policy. 
you know, um, any thoughts about that, Callie? Because I, I'm not sure how explicit, you know, that um, that agreement needs to be. So we should probably take a look at that as well. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I'm, I agree with that. I think the um, more that you have and in, in from the employee, especially because that's what this is geared towards, the better. So taking a look at all anything that would, um, you know, potentially affect that would be would be important in the situation. Yeah, definitely. Um, and this is this goes into effect in March. Is that right? Yes. OK, so we have some time. So that's that's a good thing. Um, I noticed there was also a question on the Q&A. Um, whether this applies to social media posts that are open to the public, but then you got to that. So I think you said that those are okay. So to the extent right. people keep their privacy settings pretty broad, um, still fair game, right? So um, great. There are some other questions if you want to take a look at those, Callie, but uh, thank you for giving us that update. And thank you to our listener who requested this topic. Uh, moving on to our next presenter, um, Adam Masterleo, to talk about independent contractors. Adam, tell us about the new role. I can't wait, Kristen, and I hope everyone's as excited as I am. Um, Kathy, next slide, please. So I want to first start off with why do we care about this? Um, I think it's an important topic that gets uh, lost sometimes, um, but it, it's, it has some serious implications. So classification of individuals working for a company as either an employee or an independent contractor impacts a lot of things. So on here, I have a, a couple of examples. First of all, tax obligations. As an employer, you're gonna have different tax obligations for your employees than you do for your independent contractors who perform services for your company. Um, to the extent you misclassify an individual as an independent contractor when they should really be classified as an employee, the IRS and or the New York State Department of Taxation will come knocking at your door and assess you penalties, et cetera. So there are significant tax implications associated with classification. There are also wage and hour issues. So while employees receive certain protections under federal and state law uh, relating to um, minimum wage and overtime, independent contractors have different um, protection. So that can those laws can be implicated as well. Um, the one that I see most frequently are unemployment insurance and or work and workers' compensation insurance. Uh, you as an employer have to pay premiums for each one of your employees every month uh, to both the New York State Unemployment Division and workers' compensation. Um, so to the extent you misclassify, those agencies can come knocking on your door seeking unpaid premiums, penalties, et cetera. So this classification issue can have really serious implications if you don't do it right. Um, where do classification problems arise? In my practice, I have seen them arise in two situations primarily. First, you may have someone who you've classified as an independent contractor, does work for you. When they're done doing their work, they file a claim for unemployment. Now they shouldn't do this because they are independent contractors, but I've seen it happen on more than one occasion. All of a sudden, the New York State Unemployment Insurance Division will take a look at this employee's claim or this individual's claim. If they determine that individual is an employee, that could open Pandora's box to an investigation of all of your independent contractors and lead to penalties, fines, et cetera. The other situation where this uh, typically arises is when the Department of Labor decides to do a random audit. This happens from time to time, and they will ask for information about your payroll, where your money, they want to see where your money's going. They will evaluate who you're providing W-2s versus 1099s. They'll look at the people who you're giving 1099s to and make determinations about whether or not those individuals are properly classified. Again, these are situations you don't want to be in as a, an employer, but they happen from time to time. So why do we care? Because it is an important issue. And if you are using independent contractors, you gotta make sure that you're doing it right. Next slide, please. So let's provide a little historical context here. Before 2021, from the 1940s really until 2021, there was a consistent rule that was adopted by the United States Department of Labor called the Economic Realities Test. It listed six factors. No one factor was more important than the other. 
And so anytime there was a question about whether uh, an individual was properly classified as an independent contractor, these six factors would be evaluated. In 2021, that changed. Um, there was a significant change, really, and the United States Department of Labor under the Trump administration adopted a new rule. This new rule elevated the significance of two core factors. The two core factors were the nature and degree of control over relevant work and the individual's opportunity for profit and loss. These two factors tend to uh, help employers out when they're classifying individuals as independent contractors because it's pretty easy to say that the nature and degree of control is limited. So for example, if you had someone who uh, was working as an IT contractor for your business, uh, your business has nothing to do with IT, but you wanted to use an IT contractor, you could easily say under these core factor under the core factor test, IT has nothing to do with the business that I'm engaged in. I have no control over when this individual works. Uh, he or she has the opportunity to uh, obtain profit and loss in whatever business they want to be involved in. Therefore, I satisfy the two core factor test. This person is properly classified as an independent con contractor. So the 2021 rule really helped out uh, employers. Next slide, please. The 2021 rule, in addition to elevating those two core factors, relegated these three factors and said they were less important. The amount of skill required for the work, the degree of permanence of the working relationship, and whether the work is part of an integrated unit of production. So the Department of Labor really switched gears, changed its focus, and implemented this more employer-friendly rule. Well, that has now changed. Next slide, please. So this 2024 rule, final rule, was just adopted on January 9th. Um, it doesn't go into effect until March 11th, but what it does is it returns to the six-factor test with no one factor presumed to carry more weight than others. So it goes back to the pre-2021 standard. And those factors include these six that I have listed here. I'm not going to read them to you, but these are the factors that are considered when the Department of Labor is looking at someone you've classified as an independent contractor now. So what do we know about this change? We know a couple of things. We know that the Department of Labor, uh, next slide, please, Kathy. I wanna get this right. The Department of Labor stated in a press release that the rule was intended to reduce the risk that employees are misclassified as independent contractors. So what does that tell you? That tells us that the Department of Labor is gonna be tightening the belt, so to speak, on who it is allowing companies to classify as independent contractors. The purpose of this rule is to make it harder for you to classify individuals as independent contractors. That's important to know. If you are using individuals to perform work for your company and you're trying to classify them as independent contractors, you need to know that this is the position the Department of Labor is going to be taking. I have here increase in enforcement activity. I wouldn't be surprised. We talked about those random audits. I wouldn't be surprised for us to, if, if we started to see more audits of companies and in particular their classification of workers as independent contractors versus employees. I think that the Department of Labor has been given a uh, uh, more, not more broad authority, but more, more power to go in and look at these six factors, say we're no longer going by those two core factor, the old two core factor test and be more restrictive in its interpretation um, of law. Another note that I think is important is that the New York State Department of Labor utilizes an entirely different standard. So I know that's not helpful for you, but the Department of Labor actually has many factors, not just six, that it looks at uh, when considering whether a worker is properly classified. So in terms of next steps, I, I always liked it when I hosted when presenters gave next steps for employers. So my next steps Number one, formalize your process. So if you are using workers and you are classifying them as independent contractors, make sure you have a formal plot process in place by which you're conducting this evaluation. 
And I will say, do it before you classify as independent contractors, rather than being reactive to some investigation from the Department of Labor. So if you currently are using an independent contractor, my advice to you is to create uh, a list, create a checklist. If you have a question, talk to your attorney, make sure that you are doing what you need to do, uh, what you should be doing, I should say, to properly classify workers. One final note here, Kristen, is an independent contractor agreement is not gonna save you. I have seen many companies who say to me when I'm hired to do represent them, when the Department of Labor is trying to say they misclassified their workers, they'll say, well, we have an independent contractor agreement, we're all set. And the answer is no, or my response is always no, that is not a, you know, a protective vest that you can wear. The Department of Labor doesn't care if you have an independent contractor agreement they are still going to evaluate those factors. So that's something to keep in mind. If you have any questions about your classification, don't hesitate to reach out to me or anyone in Bonds Labor and Employment um, Department who you work with on a regular basis. With that, Kristen, I think I'm done. Okay, great. Thank you, Adam. Um, I was smiling when you were making that last point because no doubt about it, that's a frequent refrain um, that we hear um, and, and of course, you, you think you have an agreement. I think you're an independent contractor. Contractor thinks they're an independent contractor. Everyone's on the same page of what of what the relationship is. So I can I can see the the appeal of of relying on that. But unfortunately, our government does not agree. So um, great to make that final point, Adam. I appreciate it. Okay, so my turn. Um, I wanted to talk today um, about some. Um, just kind of, this is um, on the theme I think perhaps of last week's presentation, which is a forward looking. Um, segment about what to expect this coming year. So last week, Governor Hochul um, presented her State of the State Address. So that is her big, long speech where she outlines, you know, what she sees as a priority um, in New York State in the coming year. And uh, it's a, it's actually a more than a speech. She puts out a big book that talks about her uh, initiatives in various um, places. So I took a look through it and I just wanted to point out a few of the things that I thought were interesting, you know, to me as a labor and employment attorney and to you um, who are business owners and, you know, care about these employment issues. Um, I will say that today, um, January 16th, is the day that Hochul is releasing her executive budget. And um, I just I checked just before we began the webinar. It was released about an hour ago. Uh, didn't have a chance to speed read it and, and find out. But um the state of the state's really a preview of the budget. And then the budget, although you would think with the name budget, it's just about the dollars and you know being spent uh, and taken in by the state also. But that's in New York State, the mechanism by which legislation is, is very often passed. So uh, we will take a look at the budget from um, many different perspectives, many uh, areas that are of interest to our clients. And uh, you'll be hearing more about these proposals in the coming weeks. But I, again, wanted to talk about what we were hearing in the state of the state. And if you could just go to the next slide, Kathy, uh, the biggest one by far, and we will be talking about this again, is that Governor Hochul, um, alongside her many maternal health um, initiatives, maternal health is, is going to be one of her kind of her themes in the coming year. Uh, one piece of that is to expand New York State paid family leave to include 40 hours of paid leave for prenatal medical appointments. So currently paid family leave is to to deal with medical issues related, um, you know, to those in your family. So this would be a, a corollary, I guess. And I haven't seen the, the proposed legislation yet because uh, when I wrote this, it wasn't out, um, but it would be 40, I believe, additional hours. So it wouldn't be you can use your current PFL to take prenatal appointments. It would be an additional um, leave available. So certainly stay tuned for that. And that would be first in the nation as noted here. Um, that's really the big significant one. The other references to the workplace, um, not quite as significant in my view. One, the second one is um, just a, an educational piece. Um, there's a discussion of, you know, that they've seen a rise in child labor complaints at the Department of Labor. And to address that, um, I'm not seeing a proposal of new legislation or new enforcement or new penalties, but more... Um, education. So Go Governor Hochul is directing Department of Labor to publish and distribute a bill of rights 
for child for for young workers, I would say, um, so that when you know when students would go and get their working papers um, to enable them to work, they would also be given this document from the Department of Labor that outlines their rights. And um, so, just an education piece, nothing that you as an employer have to do on your end. Just being aware that that is um, that is happening, um, so that you know young workers do understand what their rights are in the workplace, because they're you know a reminder that there are more specific rules around what hours uh, those those employees can work, the tasks that they can um, perform and, and things like that. And, you know, perhaps that would be a good topic for a future uh, presentation is a refresher on some of those rules. The next area that I noticed in the state of the state was uh, a fo focus on wage theft. So, um, you know, for a long time, we've had uh, the wage theft Protection Act in New York State, various ways that the Department of Labor can deal with employers that are unfortunately not doing the right thing, not complying with Department of Labor rules um, re regarding um, wages. And so what Governor Hochul is calling for is giving Department of Labor more tools for enforcement. Um, and it seems there'll be a focus on high turnover, low stability industries. Um, you know, thinking hospitality for one uh, seems to be an obvious target there. Um, this one caught my attention whenever I see the word enforcement and Department of Labor in the same breath, I obviously um, get interested. So I'm gonna be watching that very closely to see what those tools will be. Will, will there be um, just more boots on the ground at the Department of Labor focusing on this? Will there be increased penalties? Will there be new rights of action for employees? We don't know yet, but stay tuned and I will follow that for you. Next slide, Kathy. Um, another one is protecting outdoor workers from extreme weather. I found this um, sort of timely, right? I mean, I can think over the past years of times that I've had clients asking, hey, what do we do about, you know, X weather event? When we had the extreme smoke and smog um, from the Canadian wildfires, um, I can remember being on this uh, this webinar talking about, you know, what that how that impacts the workforce that works outdoors. What are the, the, um, the rules and the guidance? And what Governor Hochul stated in her State of the State um, document was that OSHA d actually doesn't have an official standard for extreme weather, dealing with heat and cold and air quality. And so she will be directing Department of Labor to issue guidance on this particular topic. And so we will look, keep an eye out for that. It'll certainly be something that you'll wanna be aware of as an employer. The State of the State document gave some hints as to what the areas of guidance might include. Um, you see, you see them here on the slide, you know, whether you need to offer breaks to employees, employee shade measures, free water, or visibly displaying uh, the temperature. These are not binding. This is not guidance. This is just the bait, the first initial step um, that we hear from the governor that will, will eventually lead to something that we need to really pay attention to. And uh, just very briefly, I would mention there was a, quite a focus on strengthening the healthcare workforce. Um, and and that has to do a lot about education in the healthcare sector in terms of sort of encouraging more people to get into that um, profession and uh, you know clearing the path for that. So I will say just very little about this. Um, I think it's probably a good topic for another future presentation, but she did note a goal to increase the healthcare workforce by 20% over the next five years. And I know for our healthcare clients that are listening, um, music to your ears, I'm sure, because I know that you are all struggling with very extreme healthcare um, employment shortages, making everything more difficult. So that is in many ways an encouraging um, initiative by the governor. So those were the five bullet points, the five things that jumped out at me with my very scientific review of searching for the word worker and workforce and employer. <laughs> um, yes, I confess I did not read every word um, of the entire multi-hundred page document, but that's what I have. And so hopefully, hope, I'm hoping that's helpful to you and um, more to come for sure about that. And least, or I should say last, but not least, I'm gonna turn it over to our final presenter who uh, I appreciate being here. Um, Tom Iron is a member in our Syracuse Labor Department like the rest of us. And I asked him to talk about an action, actually, we, we talk about, uh, we just talked about our, our state elected official, but what happened last week um, on a federal level with our U.S. House of Representatives voting to repeal um, a particular NLRB rule, I found this um, sort of really fascinating because you don't hear about this happening too much unless, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but go ahead, Tom, tell us about what happened and uh, what it means. Thanks, Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and you're absolutely right. This is a... Um, 
an unusual um, action by Congress. Um, but let, let me let me set the stage, and this is an issue that, um, like the topic Adam discussed, independent contractors, we're talking about joint employers, joint employment situations, and um, we have to talk about that frequently in a lot of different contexts. Here, we're talking about it in the context of joint employer status before the National Labor Relations Board or under the National Labor Relations Act. And um, as folks know, this has been a hot button issue for uh, at least 10 years. And it depends, um, again, significantly on whether we have a Republic, Republican administration or a Democratic administration. So, so what's happening now? Um, the um, Biden NLRB had had um, promulgated a final rule on joint employer status under the National Labor Relations Act. That rule was scheduled to go into effect last month. Uh, the Labor Board pushed that effective date out. It is now scheduled to go into effect on February 26th, next month, February 26th of 2024. Um, and as we think about joint employer status, we know that the um, implications can be very significant. Um, if two entities, two independent separate entities are found to be joint employers, they can each be held liable in this context by the National Labor Relations Board for the actions of the other entity. Uh, they might even be found to be bound to the other entity's collective bargaining agreement. Um, it, it is possible if two entities are found to be joint employers that there would be a proceeding to have a union represent um, employees from both uh, employers and to require both employers to jointly negotiate over um, uh, terms and conditions of employment with that union. Um, now, in what circumstances do we see this concern arising? Um, the, the, the principle and, 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 and perhaps the easiest example to identify is in the franchise um, situation, right? The franchisor and a franchisee, those who've been paying attention know that um, the National Labor Relations Board for years has been trying to get corporate McDonald's to be responsible for the um, employment decisions at individual franchises. Um, they've tried to do it through litigation and now they're trying to do it through rulemaking. Um, and not just McDonald's, obviously, but any franchise relationship. Um, goes, goes beyond that, of course. Uh, if you have um, uh, temporary employees, you have a, an arrangement with a temporary staffing agency. Um, that's a, a situation that's fraught with potential joint employer uh, implications. Um, if you have a professional employer organization or if you have an arrangement where you are leasing employees, um, all these suggest uh, circumstances where two separate entities have contracted for some arrangement to provide some employees from one employer to um, facilitate or complement the employees of another. And the labor board is uh, pursuing a um, strategy here of trying to integrate or combine or make jointly responsible the two entities. Um, and the new rule um, is, is significant because it expands the circumstances under which uh, two entities um, in the situations I've described and in other um, you know, combinations of of, of, of business planning and, and employee sharing that you see um, today. Uh, and it expands it in two really significant ways. First, um, the rule that was in effect required uh, a showing that there was direct control exercised by um, both entities over the terms of employment, over the core terms of employment. And the new rule says, um, we'll find joint employer status if there is indirect control. And even if that control, whether direct or indirect, is never exercised. So in other words, the Labor Board will scrutinize the terms that exist, the, the, the contract between the franchise 
E and the franchisor between the employer and the temporary staffing agents. Look at that contract and see whether or not um, both parties share in some form or fashion uh, control over terms and conditions of employment or terms and conditions of employment. And if so, um, it provides the predicate for um, a joint employer finding. And then the second way that this um, new rule expands um, the concept of joint employer is it expands the um, terms and conditions that the board will look at. Uh, previously, it was very focused on really truly core terms, setting wages, determining whether an individuals are hired or fired. Um, and now the board has said, no, we've got to look at um, a multitude of factors, in including those as well as who's setting the schedule, who's doing the day-to-day -day, um, supervision of the employees, uh, and other uh, broader brush um, review of, of terms and conditions. And in a typical case, uh, take the case of uh, um, temporary staff employees, there is going to be overlap between um, the control is, uh, uh, rendered by the staffing company and the control um, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, applied by the um, employer where those staff are, are um, assigned. Um, so, so this rule moves us in a direction of far greater uh, likelihood that these um, scenarios are going to lead to uh, a joint employer finding and and the implications that I mentioned above. So so strong pushback from the business community. Um, there is um, litigation pending, um, led by the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other business advocacy groups, uh, which as of this morning had not um, uh, uh, proceeded much beyond the initial stages. No action taken at this point. Uh, but we can anticipate that the litigation um, will at least address the issue of whether the rule is is um, allowed to go into effect. However, and this is this is what um, leads us to talk about this today. Congress has the ability under the um, Congressional Review Act to stop an administrative rule from going into effect. And the House of Representatives last Friday passed the necessary joint resolution um, to um, prevent this NLRB joint employer rule from going into effect. Um, now, as with any legislation, that has to pass uh, not only the House of Representatives, but it has to pass the Senate. Um, and there's some indication that even though there's a Democratic majority in the Senate, um, it's a thin majority, and this bill only needs to pass by a majority and is not subject to um, filibuster. Um, and on top of that, Senator uh, Manchin from West Virginia um, has indicated his support for the bill. So there's a, there's a reasonably good chance the bill gets through uh, Congress. And this would be a joint resolution preventing the NLRB's joint employer um, rule from going into effect. But then we run into a roadblock. Um, President Biden has said uh, that he would veto that legislation if it gets to his desk. Uh, and given the relatively thin um, majorities by which it has uh, passed or is likely to pass the Senate, an override of that veto seems um, uh, to be remote. So we end up in, at the end of the day uh, really focusing in on the, the, the uh, litigation um, which I expect to ramp up um, between now and the 26th. Um, the, the reason this is significant though is because um, it is a rarity for Congress even to take up such a joint resolution. Um, it's um, telling that both Republicans and Democrats um, have supported that resolution uh, in the House and um, likely will support it in the Senate, um, telling that the, the 
um, significance, the underlying significance of the board's rule uh, has really um, um, created concern in the business community and on both sides of the aisle. Um, I would note that the uh, litigation is filed in a uh, district court in Texas where um, similar uh, actions by um, democratic administrative um, uh, initiatives have been have been um, enjoined. Um, I won't speculate on the, the likelihood here, but it's certainly something we're keeping an eye on and and I expect that I'll be back um, in front of you all before February 26 to give you an update on um, exactly where this rule stands. Uh, with that, um, Kristen, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, Tom, I just made a note of that, that you'll be back before February 26th. So noted. Um, one last bonus point for those of you who stuck around for the end. <laughs> um, in uh, It was multitasking a slight bit because uh, there was a question in the uh, Q&A about COVID sick pay and whether it's still around. And I got to tell you, um, I get questions about this all the time. I'm sure my colleagues here do too. How is it possible that COVID sick pay is still around? And the answer it is, it is still around. Same rules apply. However, in the budget book that was released an hour ago, there um, is language suggesting that uh, Governor Hochul is going to be presenting legislation to sunset that law. Um, I don't have my eyes on it yet. I just know that it's going to be out there. So we are gonna be taking a, a look about that. We most certainly will publish something as soon as we're able to actually read the legislation and find out um, what it says, what the timing is, et cetera, um, whether it's the same as the law that was um, was um, introduced last year. So um, perhaps, maybe, there's an end in sight for COVID sick pay. So that's that was the bonus piece of information for those of you who stuck around to the end. I didn't do that intentionally. I was just following up on a Q&A question here. Um, so anyway, thanks for joining us. I thank all of our presenters for being here. I welcome you to reach out to them with any follow-up questions you have if we didn't get to your Q&A, um, which uh, we always try to do, but sometimes it's hard to get to all the questions. And um, appreciate you being here. Uh, we'll be back next week. Gabe will be hosting next Tuesday, and I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks so much.